turn to the book of Job. Book of Job chapter uh, 1 is where we will begin. And I think we need to recognize the fact that if somebody does not believe in God, if someone certainly is an atheist, then there is no answer to that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? There can be no answer because life itself would be meaningless. Bad things that happen would be nothing more than cause and effect, random events that happen by chance. So to the unbeliever, it's not really a valid question, is it? But of course, unbelievers, even they don't fully accept these conclusions. Ironically, I guess thankfully, before we read from Job, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God has done from beginning to end. Now let's begin by reading Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz named Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And thus Job did regularly. So right away we see that Job is what you would call a good man. Yes, theologically there is none good but God. That is true. But as far as by any human standard, Job was a good man. It's not a matter of him being sinless. That's not the issue. But he was upright. Job feared God and he shunned evil. If there was ever a man that could stand, a mere man that could stand before God blameless, it was Job. So Job was a good man. He was a wealthy man. He had a big family. He had many possessions. The uh, thing about the book of Job, many believe it's the oldest book in the Bible. In the story, uh, written probably about 4,000 years ago, uh, many in those days... Uh, the, the wealthy men, they did not measure their wealth by money or even by silver and gold, rather by land and livestock, as we read. So Job had it all. He had many possessions. He had his family. He had his health. And he loved his family so much that he offered sacrifices for his children just in case they might have done something wrong. So everything was well with Job. Until one day. Look at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, 
All that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there's so much packed in to these verses here. Uh, first, we are transported to heaven. We see this heavenly scene where God the Holy Spirit reveals to the author of Job. Uh, most people agree that Job is not the author of Job. Some speculate maybe Moses wrote the book or Solomon. Ultimately, we don't really know. But uh, we see this scene in heaven where the sons of God come and present themselves before the Lord. Already, that's not really what you expect, is it? It, it really gets your attention. So they present themselves before the Lord. And the sons of God here, the term sons of God, is almost certainly a reference to the angels. Now, in the New Testament, when you see sons of God, that talks about believers. But in the Old Testament, the Hebrew term B'nai Elohim refers to the angels. And of course, we know that Satan is an angel. He is a, a fallen angel created as a cherub. So Satan comes among them in verse 7. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. So another thing we see, Satan has some level of access to heaven. But apparently he spends most of his time here on the earth, uh, unfortunately for us. And that, of course, flies in the face of the myth, the unbiblical myth that Satan is the ruler of hell. Isn't this what you see and hear that Satan is in hell? It's the devil's domain. Satan is sort of the, the king of hell. Listen, Satan has never been to hell and he never wants to go to hell because hell is a place prepared for the devil and his angels. It's a place where he will end up where, as the book of Revelation puts it, he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan is not in hell. Where is he? He's here on the earth, walking to and fro. So he certainly wasn't in hell 4,000 years ago when this event took place. He is in heaven at this moment, having a conversation with God. And who is the object of his conversation? It is Job. And notice, it is the Lord who initiates the conversation. Verse 8, again, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And this starts a chain of events that will bring about extreme pain and suffering into the life of Job. There's a, a type of wager, it seems, between the Lord and the devil. Satan claims that Job only loves and serves God because everything's going well. And you wonder. There's a lot of people that say they love God and they worship God and serve God while things are going well. What happens when things take a turn? Well, this is the accusation of the devil that Job doesn't really love you. He doesn't really serve you because he has a, a personal trust in you. He's just doing it because you've been so good to him. And listen, I know some people struggle with this story. I, I, and I understand why. But I think there are some important principles to remember when it comes to pain and suffering. You can make a note of these. Number one, there is always a purpose. Always a purpose. We might not know what it is, but there's always a purpose. Job didn't know what was going on. Sometimes we read it and we don't think about what he was thinking about necessarily. Job was unaware of all of this. So number one, there is always a purpose, even if we don't know what it is. That's number one. Number two, pain and suffering is either a testing or a chastening. Let's face it, sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we make mistakes or we sin, and the scripture says the Lord chastens those whom he loves. 
Sometimes Christians suffer because of the sinful choices we make. And sometimes we have no one to blame but ourselves. Now, thankfully, God is willing to forgive us, but he doesn't necessarily remove all the consequences. But oftentimes, and this is the case here with Job, oftentimes pain, trials, and suffering is a testing from God. Listen to me, a testing to prove our love and faith towards the Lord. Not so much for his sake, he already knows. He knows ahead of time what we will say, what we will do. The testing is more for us to prove it to ourselves. This is very important to understand. Your faith will never grow unless it is tested. How many of us want our faith tested? Not too many people want it. It's the only thing that will grow our faith. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. So number one, there is always a purpose. Number two, it's likely either a testing or a chastening. And number three, perhaps the most important thing to remember in the face of trial and suffering is to remember that God is still on the throne. God is sovereign. We are his children to do with whatsoever he wants. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 46, the Lord says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand, I shall do all my pleasure. Do you realize what God is saying? He's saying, I'm God. I can do whatever I want. We need to get that through our heads. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. This does not make uh, God unjust. This does not make God unfair. We're all sinners living in a, in a fallen world. And remember, God does not punish innocent people. That has only happened once when God the Father punished his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And even then, Jesus voluntarily laid down his life. So God does not punish innocent people. God is not unjust. God is not unfair. And in the story of Job, it isn't even God who brings the death and destruction. It is the devil. It is true the Lord allows the devil to do it. Why? There's a reason. Now listen, I will be the first person to admit that sometimes when you look at life and some of the things that happened, it seems unfair. This life seems unfair. This world is unfair and many of the things that happen in it. But we cannot then conclude that God is unfair. That's what Satan wants you to think. The world is unfair. The situation's unfair. Therefore, God is unfair. That's not true. Don't believe that lie. And besides, we only see things from a certain angle in a moment in time. We don't see the big picture. Sometimes we think we do, but we don't. We know the promises of God, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God, those who are the called according to his purpose. We know that. We know the story of Joseph when his brothers sold him into slavery and he was brought down to Egypt, but the Lord exalted him in Egypt. And at the end of that whole thing, you remember what Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So while we know that God is at work, we know he has a plan in the moment, we are simply unable to know what that plan is. This is why it's called the Christian faith, okay? It's about faith. It's about trust. We walk by faith, not by sight. Job did not know the plan. Job did not understand why these things were happening. Look at chapter 1, verse 13. 
Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, Another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and raided the camels and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground, and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. You think about the worst day you've ever had. Just stop, take a few moments and think of it. You don't want to think about it, but think about the worst day you've ever had. Probably doesn't come anywhere close to what Job experienced. He's getting bad news. Before that bad news is over, more bad news, more bad news. His own children are dead. It all happened at once. And it's only going to get worse from here. Now I have a question. How should a believer in the Lord react when faced with pain and suffering? What we don't do is we don't curse God. What we don't do is we do not blame God. Amen? Amen. Amen. We don't charge the Lord with wrongdoing. Now look at chapter 2, Job chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without a cause. So whose fault is this? God's fault? It's the devil's fault. Verse 4, so Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Satan, you can do anything to him you want except kill him. You cannot kill Take his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, uh, Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot shirt with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. The disease that came upon Job came from God or the devil? From Satan. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? Shall we not accept adversity? 
And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So at this point, Job seemingly has lost everything. His health, his material possessions, his children, and now to add insult to injury, his wife tells him to curse God and die. Like Eve did to Adam, Job's wife is tempting him to sin, a sin that would lead to his death. Now listen, I, I don't know if this makes Christians feel better or not, but it at least helps us to realize that we're not alone. Sometimes people get the idea that if you're a Christian, then you're going to be blessed with good health and good fortune. That's not necessarily the case. Or some think, well, if I'm doing the right thing and trusting in God, I will be blessed financially. That's not necessarily the case. Or, well, at least if I'm a godly man, I'll have a good marriage. Not necessarily. The Bible literally says Job was the most righteous man on the face of the earth and his wife was uh, unsupportive, to say the least. And then you keep reading, Job gets a visit from his friends. And what did his friends do? Instead of supporting Job, they responded basically saying, Job, this must be all your fault. With friends like that, who needs enemies, huh? Yeah. You know what people need when they're down? They need someone to come and, and help lift them up, not kick them when they're down. Maybe if someone is suffering, you don't go to them and say, yeah, this, this might be all your fault, probably is. That's not what you do. You must deserve it. This is not helpful. And in this case, it's certainly not even true. Job's friend Eliphaz decided Job must be guilty of sin. God must be punishing Job for those secret sins. I mean, we, we can't really lay anything against him. We don't see anything wrong. There must be some hidden things, Job. Job's other friends, Bildad and Zophar, basically thought the same thing, and they thought Job should repent. Job, maybe you should examine yourself. Must be your fault somehow. And listen, you might say Job is a man. He isn't sinless. Maybe it wasn't unreasonable for his friends to think that. Well, whatever the case, Job... Whatever sin in his life he might have been guilty of, which wasn't much, I think that's clear, it was not proportional to the level of suffering that he was going through. And Job understood that. So you can at least sympathize with Job when he starts to question God a little later on. Now flip over to chapter 14, Job 14. Much of the early chapters of Job record his dialogue with his friends. Job's suffering causes him to think about the Lord and the things of the Lord. And that's what suffering will do to a person. It'll sort of wake them up and make them think about things that they wouldn't have thought about otherwise. So this all gets Job's attention, certainly. And it's true, I believe, that suffering will either make a person better or it will make them bitter. When things seem to be spiraling out of control, remember, God is still on the throne. There is a purpose. Okay, Job acknowledges this, the sovereignty of God, in chapter 14, verse 5. Look at it. He says, since, referring to man, his days are determined. The number of his months is with you, Lord. You, Lord, have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. You know, God has sort of marked out the boundaries. So God is in control of this situation. And we can take comfort in that. Look at verse 14. Job says, if a man died, now he's starting to think about the things of the Lord. And he says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. Job here seems to make a veiled reference to the resurrection. 
Now turn to chapter 19. In chapter 19, his statement of hope is not so subtle. It's not veiled at all. Job proclaims a message of hope in the midst of suffering. Job 19, 25, and 26. And he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Amen. How did he know that? He had faith. He had faith in God beyond this life. Worst case scenario, Job dies, and then he lives again with the Lord. Skip ahead to chapter 38. What's the question we are exploring? Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow pain and suffering? Or the question that people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Can we have hope in the midst of suffering? Now, Job is the go-to book in the Bible on this subject, okay? Also, the Psalms. David wrote in Psalm 37, he said, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. We've all felt this way. We see people that are good and kind and they obey the law and they're faithful to their church and their family and everything else and bad things happen to them. And then you see other people that are, well, how should we describe it? Not so good, okay? We'll just put it that way. And they, the wicked seem to prosper, right? You look around this world, what do we see? The wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. That's true, okay? That's true. To a large degree. Uh, the book of Job is considered wisdom literature. Hopefully we can learn from this story. Uh, and hopefully we can learn from our trials. And we can learn from our pain and suffering. And certainly from our mistakes. Uh, before we read from 38, in chapters 29 through 31, Job is trying to make sense out of all of this but he never curses God. But he does start to wonder, why is this happening? That's a pretty reasonable thing to think. However, when God answers Job, as God can read his heart and his mind, this is how the Lord responds to Job. Now, and the Lord says to Job, prepare yourself like a man. So I want you to prepare yourself just for this one verse. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this? He's talking about Job here. Who is this who darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? That kind of seems harsh, doesn't it? Based on everything he's gone through. And while the Lord will eventually vindicate Job and restore Job, the first thing that happens, the Lord makes sure that Job knows exactly who he's talking to. See, here, here's the key. Here's the key of this whole sermon, I think, okay? Here's the key. The more you know God, the more you will know about God, what he is doing, and why he's doing it. Amen. If you don't know God, you have pain, trial, suffering, persecution, disease, everything else, what do you conclude? Life is unfair. If there is a God, he's unfair. Brings you down the wrong road. But the more you know God, the more you'll understand. Again, you might not get it all, but you will understand what God wants you to take from it. So, why do bad things happen? Why does God allow us to suffer? Just some closing thoughts. Based on what we read at the beginning of this book, keep in mind there are things going on in the spiritual realm we have no idea about. We have no knowledge of it. Number two, we can't assume that because someone is suffering, they are being judged by God. 
The scripture reading was John chapter 9, the man born blind. What did the people say? Who sinned, him or his parents, that he was born blind? Some people, they see someone's going through heartache and suffering and, and trials. Well, it must be their fault. Not necessarily. So we can't assume that people suffer because they're being judged by God. Maybe, maybe not. Number three, God has a purpose for all things, even if we don't know what that purpose is. Again, this is why it is called faith. And it's worth repeating that our faith cannot grow, it will not grow, unless we are tested. So if you're being tested right now, what should you do? Count it all joy. <laughs> Number four, I believe this, the times that God feels a million miles away may be the times that he is closest to us. Amen. And finally, number five, for the unbeliever, there is no end to suffering. But for the believer, according to Psalm 30, verse five, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we stand in amazement, knowing that your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts higher than our thoughts. Through your servant Job, you silenced the accusation of the devil. You not only strengthened his faith, but you restored Job, giving him twice as much as he had before. And the book of Job ends with these words, it says, And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. And Father, give your people peace and understanding. Give them the peace that surpasses all understanding through the grace and knowledge of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, it's in his name we pray.